Hello, everyone, and welcome to day, today's session. Thank you for taking the time to be here today. I know we're competing against spring and warm weather. Today, we are presenting Closing the Equity Gap. It's really a network gap with Kelly Cooper and Dr. Gregory Hale. My name is Lori Burris, and I'm the Education Innovation Advisor at LinkedIn Learning, the leading provider of learning online videos. I'll be moderating the panel today. Just a little housekeeping before we get started. Don't worry, we'll be sending out an on-demand recording of this webinar as soon as it's available. Any presentation decks or additional materials will be sent to you as well. If you have any questions during the presentation, please type them into the question and answer box. This is where we'll be looking for questions for the panelists. It's in your Zoom control panel, usually at the bottom. We'll bring the questions up during the presentation and we'll have time for questions at the end of this session. I encourage you to share socially and professionally with your audience members. You can use hashtag HED leaders. And for those of you just joining us for the first time, welcome and know that we love to hear from you. Now, without further ado, let's hear from our panelists. The three of us have been discussing this issue, issue of the equity gap from the perspective of the network gap for over a year, but the pandemic interrupted our original date in the fall of 2020, but we didn't give up. And so we're here today. The, today's format is a conversation and it's a dialogue and a chance for you to get your questions answered. Would each of you take a moment to briefly share a little bit about who you are and what your current role is? Kelly, I'll start with you first. Thank you, Lori, and thanks for inviting me. I'd like also to give a shout out to Ryan Zervakos, who has been at West Hills Community College District, our great fan and supporter for LinkedIn and for LinkedIn Learning. I'd like to start by offering that in my early career as an introvert, I thought networking was only a verb. I was nervous about going, wanted to be in the kitchen and cleaning up more than I wanted to be out meeting with other people. And then something shifted because I realized when I work alone, no matter the hours I put in, I can only do what I can do. Then I started going to networking events thinking maybe I can meet two people. Maybe I can come up with two projects. And over the years, I determined most importantly that networking and network is both a verb and a noun. Once I started building networks for projects, be they volunteer projects or work-related projects, I was able to participate, collaborate, understand people a lot better, and those projects then got momentum. I'd like to share just for a moment about who I am in the network and how I can contribute to the network. My obsession is livable wage jobs. I loosely define those as affording a safe place to live with your family, however you define that, reliable transportation, healthy food, access to good health care, consistent broadband and other utilities, and a family weekend activity or Friday night pizza. Livable wage jobs do not end racism. They do not end the gulf between the haves and the have nots. But I believe livable wage jobs and the safe environment that they support allow us as a network to develop and implement action plans and programs that will then leave us in a situation where together we can attack societal problems. I'm an idea person and I'm an implementer. I consider myself a good friend as a contributor and as a collaborator, I offer deep experience in open public education, teaching and administration. I'm strong in technology and operations. I'm a decades long consistent volunteer of 15 to 20 hours a week, typically writing grants, building industry driven CTE programs and mentoring teachers or administrators. I hope to convey to you today some of the ideas, challenges, and stalls that we have had in our network. And I hope that after this session that we can connect and work together toward interesting and important projects. Thanks, Laurie. Well, thank you, Kelly. That was quite an introduction. Greg, your turn. See if you can match up with that. <laughs> oh, indeed. First, Lori, it's a pleasure to be here. Kelly, it's great to be here with you and the LinkedIn team. So my name is Greg Hale. I serve as the president of Broward College. Uh, Broward College has about 60,000 students. We are a community college that offers baccalaureate degrees and we've been offering baccalaureate degrees uh, for about 15 or so years now. Uh, we are an incredibly diverse institution. Uh, of our 60,000 students, about two thirds are minority students. 
we have about 150 languages of origin spoken among our student body. Uh, 150 countries of origin actually represented among our student body and 50 languages of origin spoken among our student body. Um, we're also located by way of partnership in 10 countries around the world. And our diversity, we believe, is our greatest source uh, for our success. Uh, now, before becoming president of Broward College, I grew up in South Jamaica, Queens, New York. Um, frankly, during quite a difficult time, uh, it was a very challenged community. And I ended up being the first in my family to go to college and graduate from college. And before all of that, I can tell you that I had no collegiate network. And I know what it is not to have that network. And of course, we spend a great deal of our time in partnership with LinkedIn to strengthen the network of our student body, which again, is mostly low income coming from Pell eligible backgrounds and most of whom are first generation college students. I'm grateful to be here. and I look forward to telling you more about what we're doing. Thank you to both of you. It's an honor to have you speaking with us today. You both bring such value and strategic leadership to uh, this conversation. So let's get started. We would all like to believe that two people with equal talent should have equal access to opportunity. But unfortunately, that's not the case. Some people don't have the right connections or community to help them land the job they want. The network gap is both a symptom and an amplifier of inequality and the accompanying complexities of this topic. For the big picture, networks do have power. Having strong networks is critical for success in college as well as for getting a job. Who you know matters and research proves that's true. Of course, we would be telling you that at LinkedIn. More than 70% of professionals get hired at companies where they already have a connection. 50% get access to jobs through personal relationships and you are nine times more likely to get a job by asking for a referral. But there's a serious consequence out there. 80% of students fear that their background will negatively impact their career. We want you all to be a part of this conversation. In chat, let us know if any time in your career you were able to land a job by virtue of a relationship that introduced you to an opportunity, made you aware of an opportunity, came from a reference, or Maybe somebody made a recommendation on your behalf. I'll give you a few seconds and then Elma, let us know what you're seeing in the chat. Certainly, Lori, I will do that. There are quite a few responses. Uh, some folks are, um, I've seen, quite a few folks are seen from their jobs. They've made um, connections and relationships from their jobs. Most have been from my jobs. So my, this is my point, almost mm -hmm. unanimously, Every one of us today can recount a time when a network connection has made a difference in reaching our personal, our educational, or professional goals. Networks are not distributed equally. First generation, low income, and students of color continue to graduate from college at lower rates. Data measured by zip code, college, and employer show that underserved students' networks matter for long-term economic opportunities. Who are the people most likely to have strong networks? It shows up in the data we have at LinkedIn. It works according to the neighborhood, the school, and work. High-income neighborhoods are three times more likely to have a strong network. Those who attend top universities, two times more likely to have a strong network. And those who work for a top company two times more likely to have a strong network. If you benefit from all three dynamics, you're 12 times more likely to have a strong network, the kind of network that creates opportunities. So what if you have the aptitude, you've got the grit, the resilience, the growth mindset, the compassion? What if you're exactly the kind of person the organizations are looking to hire? You have the, the, the skills and the talent, but you didn't grow up in a high income neighborhood. You didn't go to a top school and you haven't worked for a top company. That's the heart of the network gap. The network gap in college can be affected by connections built through previous academic experiences and have an impact on future mentorship, internship, or job opportunities. Today's panelists, Kelly and Greg, are connecting students to equitable opportunities and addressing this network gap. So Greg and Kelly, feel free, either one of you, to speak. Equity gaps occur in a, a variety of ways. What are some of the issues that you both see need addressing? I'm happy to start. Um, so there, there are so many different types of gap, whether they may relate to food insecurity, whether they relate to affordability, which we know are very commonplace in our community college system in particular. But one of the things that we continue to use as a steady refrain is time, technology, and transportation. 
oftentimes when we're thinking about our students, most of whom are part-time students, they're working jobs, um, they may have families, they may not simply have the time that it takes to engage in the networking that could be essential to their growth, whether it be their economic growth or expansion of their network in general. We also know that transportation for many of our students, many of the members of our community can be a, a significant challenge as well. If you're asking someone to take two buses to get to college and to build their network, you're automatically making it very, very difficult. And I often think about a student who I met years ago who would take four miles of walking every day to get to school. And I would always think about how amazing this student was and the kind of grit that she had on display. But I also thought that there are so many who just simply could not imagine traversing four miles every day by foot to get to class. And so those are challenges that we know exist for many. And then finally, I'll say technology. And that's probably never been more salient than it is right now. We know the, the, the inadequacy that exists as it relates to the technology infrastructure for so many people. And that divide has probably never been more salient than it is now. So when I think about a lot of the challenges that we see from an equity perspective, time, technology, and transportation are chief among them, of course, with affordability as well. And Kelly, you represent the Central Valley and the community college districts in that area. What kind of issues do you see that need addressing there? Well, for this question, I think I'd like to talk a little bit about what our responsibilities are as educators and where we're missing the mark, where we're, with all great intention, really not offering equitable access. One of the things that we do is a few years ago, we decided to put guided pathways in place. And the idea with guided path pathways was we want students to be able to get through the community college system in some sort of a two-year process, like a 15-15, 15-15. And in California, we opened up the California Promise, really thinking that this was going to encourage education in areas that struggled with equitable uh, DEI, et cetera. But here's the problem, and that is it's us. Right? I mean, how is it that we think? Not all students are going to be guided pathway students. Not all part-time students want to deal with an ed plan and with FAFSA. We need to have some sort of a one click like Amazon does when we wanna take one class. I think too, the way that we see careers and the way that we're advising needs to be more industry driven and industry related. For example, if I'm a student and I attend a great class with a great instructor, maybe that class is psychology or maybe that class is sociology and that the class really resonates with me, then oftentimes we guide students into the guided pathway for psychology or for sociology. And we never talk to those students about welding, about advanced manufacturing, about uh, working in coding, et cetera, where there are great jobs with not nearly enough people in them. My concern then is our responsibility toward equity, our responsibility with understanding where the jobs currently are. As a nation, we have a lame labor market information system. Um, I've been working with LinkedIn to try to put together a new program for Downey Unified School District down in the greater LA metropolitan area. But it's us too, because we need to understand our customers. We need to understand uh, there's no questioning our commitment, but our methods are so ingrained in years. If I'm a psychology major who is not interested in being an MFC or a social worker or a high school or a college counselor, maybe I need counseling to understand psychology would be a great minor. What about a different major? What about business, which would take me into human resources? What about the fact that I don't think that I'm prepared for math? but I could be prepared for math. And so what we've tried to do in California with 2 million or 2.2 million students is find a common ground. What does that have to do with equity? There, there is no common ground when there are 2.1 or 2.2 million students in a system. So we're not listening. We're, we're listening for how you fit, not listening for how we don't. We can't be Kmart and Sears. I mean, people worked there for generations and loved every mini of it and still are dumbfounded on, on how it is that it closed. So my first thought in the infrastructure is to really take a look at us and to take a look at where exceptional jobs are. The current administrative policy or process or gazillion dollar hopes for infrastructure create unbelievable jobs in broadband and again, in advanced manufacturing and welding. And we need to catch up. 
It's us that needs to catch up. Yeah, so it's almost an internal communication problem. I always have said that colleges and universities are great externally, but internally communication and even across large systems that community colleges and public universities face, the communication can fail. Um, so again, to both of you, we know that networks are not equal. So what are some of the options, the strategies? What can we do for students to ensure that they have the right skill sets? Do you have some thoughts on that, either one of you? Uh, yes. Uh, so, so one of the things, and I think uh, Kelly raises a great point about looking internally. Um, and when you think about it from an equity perspective, you know, oftentimes, and we're, whether it's internal discussion or external discussion, we're talking about the data first. And when we're thinking about collegiate institutions and the exposure that comes with that or the lack thereof, we know that there have been historic challenges. So if I were to take you 50 years ago, you would see that the bottom quartile of income earners had about 25% of their kids going to college and the top quartile of income earners had about 40% of their kids going to college. So uh, bottom 25, 6%, top 25, 40%. You come to today, the top 25% of income earners have gone from about 40% of their kids going to college to 77%. The bottom quartile has gone from 6% to a mere 9%. So the bottom quartile has seen inertia. And part of the reality is they haven't had the exposure or network to those opportunities. You know, one of my stories that I often tell our students, I grew up in a very challenging neighborhood. I was going to end up being the first person in my family to go to college. And in the neighborhood I grew up in, it was so bad, my mother decided to lie about my address so I could go to school in a different neighborhood. And so I go to school in a different neighborhood. I go through the projects. I get on the bus for 45 minutes. I walk for another 10 minutes. And it's an elementary school. I started this in third grade. In the sixth grade, it's 1989. I say to a friend, is it this amazing? We're going to be the last class of the decade because we're graduating. And he says immediately, no, we're going to be the last class of the millennium because we're going to graduate college in 1999. That was the first time I had ever heard the word college. And here I am hearing the word college for the first time in the sixth grade, no less, from another sixth grader who knows exactly what year he's going to graduate. And so when we think about what techniques we need to deploy it has to be laden in the power of proximity of how do we make sure we are actually providing, changing our systems, as Kelly put it, to engage in communities that otherwise would never see exposure to post-secondary education. And so one of the things that we've been implementing for the last three years at Broward College is what we call Broward Up, UP standing for unlimited potential. We so often ask students or potential students who live in homes where college is not discussed or neighborhoods where college is not discussed, or even worse, often told like I was, that if I ever made it to college, I would never survive. Those conversations are happening daily. So unless we change our systems to go into communities to actually start to acculturate individualize, uh, individuals that would otherwise not have the, that exposure, you are losing. And so what we've been doing for the last two year, three years, it's not simply saying for those who can get to us, we've actually gone into those communities and we have stayed there much like a parent would who's talking to their child on a daily basis, being a college that is in the community that needs us most on a daily basis. We've added 27 partners throughout our community. We've added 19 new location in the heart of zip codes that have the highest unemployment rate and lowest post-secondary attainment rate. Now, many people had challenged us early on and said, no one's going to want it. Well, since we launched it, nearly 3000 students have been served. 1900 certifications or industry certifications. And now students who otherwise were never touched by post-secondary opportunity are enrolling in credit bearing programs and seeking associate degrees and baccalaureate degrees. So as we think about systems changes and access changes and knowing that post-secondary opportunity is the fulcrum to so many other great things in life, a healthier life, financial outcomes, less likely to be unemployed, more likely to live a healthy, long life we have to look at those systems changes that come with it. And by the way, underlying all of that is the impact on equity. Most of the folks that we're serving are low income. Most of them are black and brown individuals in our community that otherwise would have not been touched but what I by what I believe to be the most powerful tool for upward mobility. You know, I love what you just, 
I just wanted to say one thing. I do, I do love what you just said, Greg. You're not, you know, if you think of our elite colleges, they try to woo you to them, but you're saying you don't wait for that. You go out to them. And I love that proactive idea. I'm, I'm going to be here for you. I'm going to be a constant in your life. Okay, Kelly, tell us what you want to say on this, this topic. Well, I want to echo Greg and add a different context. West Hills Community College District is 3,500 square miles of rural California with intermittent, well, actually pretty weak broadband access. And how is it that you then build this type of network in that context? And what we're doing is thinking of ourselves as the community hub more than we are as the community college. And as such, we're looking at what does learning look like in this community? And in our community, learning looks like taking some classes. Sometimes you have to leave for work. It's seasonal quite a bit of the time because we're primarily agriculture, uh, oil and military and incarcerated. And what ends up happening is students can come and go, but we try to keep them in this community hub. A couple of new programs that we're trying at West Hills College Lemoore, one is a Friday school. And that is you join a cohort, you pick a, ma a major, and with your AA degree, you only come to school on Friday so that you get together once a week, you're celebrating together, talking together, meeting everyone, the rest of the week that you work, you work online. And we're hoping that this is a way that we can go to the community and go to students. The same with our technology courses. We're trying to offer a new, well, we're just starting truthfully, a new program called Skills Valley, kind of a takeoff of the San Joaquin Valley and Silicon Valley. And at Skills Valley, we're doing just weekend, come in for the weekend. Some of it will be for credit, some of it will be contracted, et cetera. But to Greg's point, that is we're about learning we do have a responsibility to be compliant because we're public institutions, but our states understand and are very open when in the past, maybe not so much, but now they understand we have to accelerate. We have to connect. And the only way that we can do that is in community. And so the community college then is again, the community hub, just one part of the learning environment. This is where we offer um, public speaking. It's where we offer clubs. It's where we offer opportunities, apprenticeships, all of these different things. At West Hills College Kalinga, we have a farm of the future. We have industry come in to talk about the latest technologies with irrigation, internet of things, et cetera. Those are just small examples. We're a small district, but it goes to Greg's point, And that is we need to get out. Uh, we need to support each other internally, internally, and then we need to get out externally. And that doesn't mean an outreach program. That means all of us. Those are great insights. Greg, I want to give you a little time to talk about some of the specific programs that you're doing at Broward College that address the network gap and are really changing and moving the needle to, to student success and, and, and getting professionally hired. Yeah. I mean, one of them that you and I've talked about, and I'm happy to share and, in, and launch today, are stories of grit. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I'll... Um... So thank you so much, Lori. When we started this conversation a year ago about stories of grit, uh, it really started where it's supposed to, and that is with the student. Uh, when we think about our students, oftentimes, particularly those from the most challenged backgrounds, they don't have the same stories that would catalyze a great conversation. They don't necessarily uh, get to say that they had a, you know, a great summer trip to some foreign country where they learned the language or... Um, those stories just don't necessarily exist, but what they don't often realize, and frankly, what I didn't often realize, is that the things that they experienced are the foundation for their ability to be successful later on in life. You know, oftentimes you can think about the spectrum of challenge, and there's a really important sweet spot in the spectrum of challenge. There are some people who've been so challenged, and it's really difficult, really, I mean, really difficult for them to overcome it for a lot of reasons. And then there are some folks who really haven't faced much challenge, but when they face it, they don't know how to handle it. But then there is this pretty deep, deep sweet spot where people have been through a lot and it has strengthened them. And many of our students have been through a lot. It has strengthened them, but they don't know how to articulate that. And so you can imagine whether it be a single parent or someone who's grown up in a, dink, uh, a difficult neighborhood that those stories are really to the extent that they are able to articulate it with our help through some of what we start, start to call grit tales or stories of grit can tell an employer 
that if they've overcome some of these challenges of their past, there is nothing an employer challenge can bring to them that they can't overcome. And that's what employers want. They want individuals who, one, will show loyalty, but two, know how to solve problems, know how to face challenges, not run from them, but face them head on and have the experience and grit to lean on as they do that. So I love here, you've pulled an example as we start to bring this to fruition. Um, and I know this example will be one, one of many uh, as we think about the stories that our 60,000 students and the many community college students across the country have and be able to articulate those in a way that is brings out their strengths and of course can be received well by our employers. I, I really love what you just said. I, I'm going to I'm going to use it now, Greg, spectrum of challenges. We talk about all kinds of different spectrums, but the spectrum of challenges and that that early data I gave to you that 80 percent and I've encountered this myself in my teaching experiences, both at USC and at Pasadena City College and even at Otis Art Institute, that students often are embarrassed to tell their stories. They are, there's some shame in, uh, uh, associated with it, that it exposes them as not being good enough or not deserving enough. And um, I really like the attitude that you're both taking to, to create this place where it's a safe, trusted community to have this dialogue. I, I think a lot of these conversations have to do with the value systems that are at, at the different institutions that we're creating, that we're creating more uh, a more humanistic uh, a situation for people. Um, maybe you could each address a little bit about, you know, some key stories that you'd like to share of success um, where this has really made a difference. And while you're talking, I'm sharing a few little things just to show how Greg's um, sort of multi-pronged approach of getting every person on every team at Broward from marketing to uh, alumni to career services to academic success to specialized programs to um, a skunk team uh, that all work uh, towards trying to move that needle. I've been meeting with uh, Greg for over a year at Broward and just in terms of these meetings we've seen that 10 times are more likely now to view and apply for jobs at Broward College. That's a significant piece of data that didn't exist over 18 months ago at Broward. That's an amazing thing to see. To see. So um, any thoughts there for both of you about how partnerships, state systems, third parties, how we, how do, we can't do this alone. So give me some thoughts about how we can work together to get some, to address these things. I'm gonna push back a little bit, um, not on the idea of the origin story, because I think that that's important because it helps us to understand ourselves but as educators in the way we tell the origin story. At West Hills, we can get and do get a, a plethora of grant funds. And if I were to put our poverty statistics, our college graduate statistics, everything on a screen, then it's a miss, right? Because if I do that, then everyone sees how much we need to overcome for our students, but rather, I think it's a good idea when it comes to equity to be the voice of overcame instead. And what that means is when we apply for grants, instead of saying everything we don't have and everything we're not, we focus on just the pride and the possibility of a rural community who feeds 75% of the world. Um, we really can be who we are and move forward with that and claim that. And I think that when we talk about our origin stories, it's, I don't wanna sound like I'm discounting the origin story, but if I were to tell you my origin story, you would come up with a little bit of a label for me. And I don't wanna do that. I want us to come together with the assumption that we're all here to learn and that we're gonna support each other. Some of us are strong in one area, some of us are strong in another, and how is it that we can be a network to go out and get those jobs? So. Again, I think that the origin story is important, but I think we can overplay it a little bit and it instills, oh, you've done so much, you've overcome so much, when I think that we need to equally st instill it. Um, I'm glad you're here together. There's nothing that we can't do. Let's sit down, put a plan in place, let's talk about it and keep in communication. For example, we have a center in a small town called Firebaugh very small town and it's a beautiful center. And some people 
not in the Firebug community, but elsewhere, thought this was a great opportunity for basic skills classes and for ESL classes and for some beginning agriculture classes. And we were like, what? No, this is a CTE facility for computer science and for physics and for biology and for chemistry and for working in failure analysis in an oil, oil field for putting together IoT systems for large scale agriculture and wind farms and solar farms. So I'm a little bit nervous when I speak about this because I don't want to miss step, but I think that we need to give and our students need to assume a little bit more um, momentum, uh, pride is not the right word, but just joining the network is a great step forward. And let's recognize what was before, but we don't have to bring all of that forward with us. I think that's true, but I think it's important. I, I've encountered this where students have left off that I'm Latinx or that I grew up in a country where there was political issues. And I don't think that it's unimportant to do this. I mean, there's a great deal of attention being paid to social inequity right now at many universities and colleges, not just at community colleges. And values seem to play an important role here. Um, you know, I think you could both speak a little bit about the values that a community college needs to support and address social inequity and inequities, and at the same time, create opportunity. I think there's two stories, Kelly. There's, you know, where you came from and where you want to go. Um, when I have students talk about what should I put on my, what's the story I should put on my profile? I say, tell me who you are, what you do, and where you want to be. Tell me what your aspirations are. I, I think it's a three-part story. Um, it, and it's a moving story. It doesn't, it, there's nothing static about it. Um, and I, I really wanna address uh, right now what you think are some of the doable actions for the short term and for the long term. And one of the good things about the pandemic is it's been what I call a disruptor for good. It showed we can do things fast. We can get everybody online in two weeks or less. Um, it showed us that we can get teachers trained to teach online in six months um, and be better teachers and talk about pedagogy and not just spaces and what rooms are available. Um, I, I mean, I've really seen a huge change in the conversations at faculty meetings. Um, maybe you could talk to me what you think about the short term things you'd like to see and long term, those things we just have to keep Keep heading towards even though they take more time yeah i would you know you're right about this last year in particular and the things that we've learned um you know we have students um as are around the country but similar to broward college surely who because we moved all of our programming online uh they've been able to actually take more classes um because of the challenges and uh and the balances that they've had to create for themselves uh, by the same token, of course, because we've moved all of our classes uh, to a remote environment, or at least the overwhelming majority of them, many of them simply, again, do not have the technology infrastructure. Um, and so it's caused them to take less classes. And of course, there's been so many variety of factors that have imp impacted people's lives. Um, you know, we've had students who have disclosed that they've had to go to um, a local store to leverage the Wi-Fi technology there to do their homework uh, because they don't have it at home. Those are real challenges. But in this process, what we've learned is we have to get even better. I mean, it's just part of our culture to make sure that we are wrapping whatever tools we have around and customizing them around each of our students. But we realize there's even a greater level of custom customization um, required, whether it be now with the dynamics of moving more programming online and then, of course, inevitably welcoming students back um, uh, to face-to-face -face and brick and mortar learning environments. And so that's um, a cultural strategy for all of us to make sure that for those who were benefiting from the remote environment, that we make sure that we continue to provide the tools that are available to those. And again, you're talking about 60,000 different preferences, of course, because everyone's got a very different um, modality uh, that works for them. And then, of course, those that are coming back. So it really changes the entire sense of what does it really mean to customize around each of our students and make sure that all of them have the opportunity. You know, when we talk about um, the import of, of, of creating opportunity in, in the value system, Lori, that you talk about, one of the things that we always very simply do is come back to the Truman Commission report of 1947, in which it was very clearly laid out that no geographic boundary shall play a role in post-secondary access race shall not play a role in post-secondary access. The language they used then was the wealth of your father shall not play a role in post-secondary access opportunity and upward mobility. All of these sentiments 
are not new to Broward College or new uh, in the last 50 years. These are things that have been embedded in the basis for our existence. And so challengingly, unfortunately, some of these barriers, many of them continue to persist today. And now we have this, you talked about the collective action, like never before, in large part because of this last year and the many events that have occurred, we're seeing collective action like we've never seen. We've seen nonprofit organizations opening up space at no cost to us. We've seen cities opening up space at no cost to us to make sure we're bringing opportunity to their residents. We're seeing the business community who have decided, and the conversation has changed, and I'll touch on this a little bit, that this is an important part of their work, not just the profits, but making sure that the social equity piece is a part of it. And among the things that we're doing is working with our local business community who have decided we have, a like many communities, have uh, uh, the top CEOs from the private sector who come together and they're just, they've declared goals for our community. Their number one goal in Broward County is equity. And they've partnered with Broward College because they know in light of their number one goal that post-secondary opportunity is the fulcrum to achieving equity. And so they've decided that they will invest in those six zip codes that have the greatest challenges. And it's these kinds of partnerships, it's these shared value systems and the collective action inevitably. And of course, with us leaning into our history, the Truman Commission and who we are as community colleges designed to create opportunity for everyone that it's really um, reached a unique level of confluence that we are incredibly excited about. I'm excited to hear that. I'm excited to hear that businesses, communities, and education want to work together. Um, you know, I've, I've been on so many panels where they talk the talk, but for once, I kind of agree with you, Greg. I do see momentum here. Um, businesses be willing to be uh, outspoken about these issues, but also to do something, to actually have actions. Kelly, I want to give you a chance to respond about short-term, long-term, what visions you sort of see there at the moment. I'll start with what Greg mentioned about um, pu public-private partnerships. We really need to bring industry in, and not in as an advisory board committee, but in to work with us on curriculum, to offer internships and apprenticeships and pre-apprenticeships to our students. We need to have them at meetings, have them speaking with faculty. There's plenty of grant funding available to afford that and to support that. But the separation between the public school system and the public sector and the private sector has to come together because these silos are not doing our students any favor. The other short-term approach is I believe we need to take CTE stronger down into the K-12 system. And we can do that immediately by working with our K-12 partners, whether that be dual enrollment or concurrent enrollment, whether that be going in and be an active partner with them in the same way that we're asking business to be an active partner with us when I'm looking at LinkedIn, it's great to see this collective, um, but I would like to see more of what's happening, what's working, what's not working operationally, how they're getting funding, which companies are willing to do this or that. There's a lot of opportunity out there, but we need to remember that when we educate, we educate the whole person and no one is discounting the value of a liberal arts education. No one is discounting the value of a certificate or a degree, but we have a lifelong partnership with those people in our community. And whether they be in K-12 getting an associate degree at the same time that they get their bachelor's, or excuse me, their high school diploma in ag business in Avenal, or whether they are incarcerated students who are credit by exam and are able to finish up their degrees, we have to be willing to see things differently and to partner differently. And so in the short term, I would say the partnerships, which goes again back to the network and getting our classified staff, classified managers, confidentials, our faculty, part-time faculty particularly involved, I think would rejuvenate a lot of what we're doing and give us the confidence for teachers who are so inundated with the needs of students that it's tough to stay current and it's tough, tough to stay informed. So I think it's a different level of partnership is what we're going to need in the immediate. Well, you know, Kelly and Greg, we're seeing some of those trends. I can always mention LinkedIn data. You're right. The network gap isn't new. I'm so glad you brought up the Truman doc doctrine. Uh, the COVID-19 pandemic 
was an accelerant. Uh, it dispro disproportionately impacted communities that were already facing labor uh, barriers in the labor market. And this means that networks will become even more important, important as people look for new jobs at, during post pandemic. But we at LinkedIn and LinkedIn Learning think it's a solvable problem. Um, I've given you guys the opportunity to maybe say, have you helped someone outside your network? I don't want you to leave today without thinking that there's three actionable things that you could do. You could redefine what a connection means. You could tap into hiring people from non-traditional backgrounds. You could seek someone outside of your network. Any one of you could do that. Reach out, invite someone. So I'm going to give you a chance to, clo uh, to kind of close up your last thoughts, and then we're going to go to Q&A, Greg and Kelly. Um, any last thoughts? Uh, what changes we need to be, the one point you'd like to make about the changes that need to be made, the vision you have, just give us any of those last thoughts. I guess my recommendation would be that education is a calling. And for those of you who are educators and are watching, I encourage you to choose one thing that you're passionate about, that you would do if you could retire, that you would do if there were not a pandemic and if there were plenty of money available and really let that passion guide your second wind and then encourage your network to be open for your ideas. That might be additional types of workshops, that might be writing new curriculum, that might be a new grant that is something completely different, that might be bringing folklorical classes into your college. Any of those things that are in the land of equity where we know one thing, and that is if we get to know each other and if we get to know each other's stories, then we can accomplish anything together. So that would be my thought for educators is we're hearing everyone's worn out and rightly so, but there's always the promise and there's always the hope of what we contribute and the significant changes that we make in people's lives. And I think choosing one go for it, wild and crazy idea that just you can't help but be excited about when you're driving around and grading papers, I think that's a great place to start for each of us to do that. And I would- a um, couple thoughts. Sure, I, I'll, I'll speak to employers and educators um, and, and frankly, policymakers as well to the extent that there are any listening. You know, one of the things that we have to start with is looking inside of ourselves, a self audit, if you will, of what um, barriers you might be creating as an institution. Uh, and what do the numbers tell you about how well you are serving those who may be facing inequities? Uh, that's number one. You have to take a look at it and it takes courage to look at it. And number two, and this is harder than looking at it, that is acting upon it. Once you know it exists, it becomes incumbent upon leaders in these fields to actually engage in the work necessary. And there are a lot of reasons that people find not to do it. Sometimes they say, well, we don't know what to do or, uh, or you know, what we're thinking about has never been done before, so should we really do it? What you have to realize is you cannot sit on your hands once you know the information. You have to decide to move forward. And there's so much context around it and there's so many different ways. So I can't speak to any one uh, way of doing it, but unearth the information, have, have the courage to do so, and then have the courage to act upon it. So true. So now I'm gonna open it up to the audience. Um, Elma, you've been watching the Q&A chat box. Uh, give us some, uh, let, we'd love to hear from the attendees and what they have on their mind. Absolutely, Lori. And I must say, um, just from the chat, I would say we have actually started to close a little bit of that networking gap. The amount of networking that's happening on the chat is amazing. Um, there, yeah, a lot of connections and folks are actually, my first real simple question, folks are actually hoping that they can get access to the chat because of all the networking that's happening. So very exciting to see all the, the connections that are being made and the networking that's happening. The first um, question that we had, which is a popular one, was around alumni. So the question is, I have an issue I faced. It, um, an issue that I faced is that there are no real alumni career services at the schools I graduated from. What ongoing career services do the panelist schools provide for their graduates? Yeah, I'm happy to jump in on this one here because this is really important to me. When I stepped into the role of president, it was one of the first things that I wanted to do as our institution. So let me start with what I thought was a myth. Uh, maybe some of you will disagree, but um, you know, community colleges in particular, you know, they 
I believe in my heart of hearts that community colleges transform lives in a way that perhaps many other sectors of higher education don't. Most of our students, unlike most sectors, are first generation. Most of our students are low income and have the kinds of barriers we've been discussing today. I share that with you because we had a history, frankly, of not really providing a lot of alumni support with the thought, with the myth, if you will, that the alumni don't really take very much interest in their exposure to community colleges. They'll spend most of their resources on the universities. And that may be true empirically, but what I have learned from talking to community college graduates, those from Broward College, is that they believe our moment transformed their lives when no one else wanted them or when they couldn't find anywhere else to go or they couldn't think of anywhere else to go. They came to us, they had teachers that loved them and advisors that loved them and helped them get to where they are today. That is powerful. And so when you realize you have that kind of impact on someone, it became incumbent upon us, in my view, to spend our time connected to those folks because for two reasons. One, they have great stories of success to tell and those stories tie back to where they started. They provide great inspiration to our current students and our current students are now connected through our alumni program. And because those alumni come back, whether they've been out for one year or 20 years and they come and talk to our students and say, I know it's hard, but I'm an example of what's possible. So those connections have been great and that speaks to the motivation, but it also of course speaks to whatever uh, professional success those folks have had as well as tying the professional opportunity through that. Now we've had, again, thank you, Lori and LinkedIn, great success with these partnerships because we have about 84,000 alumni on LinkedIn. And we've seen a lot of connections between our students and alumni who graduated from Broward College. And that's the power of that. Now, again, we started this in earnest just under three years ago, and I suspect that we'll see continued growth going forward. But that relationship, that understanding of the potency of the work of community college as it provides liftoff for someone to the life that they seek, I think is just incredibly powerful and something that provides great tie back as an alumni to our current students. I would agree with you, Greg, that uh, community colleges have underserved alumni and um, many of our alumni do have stories to tell and they become future employees. I mean, most of the students I taught at Pasadena City College have offered jobs to students I'm currently teaching and that that right there is a connection that wouldn't exist if the, the, but for the Pasadena City College connection. Um, another question, let's move on to another one. I wanna make sure we answer as many as we can before the, uh, the 50 minutes is up here. Absolutely, or another question has to do with internships. Many students that I work with are interested in industries where they are more likely to only find unpaid internships. What are your recommendations for next steps or resources for students without a network in those industries, but who also may not be able to afford an unpaid internship? You wanna go for that, Kelly? Sure, I'm against unpaid internships. Um, Me too. And the, the reason that I am is because um, it's not a favor, it's a job. And because the type of skills, accountability and learning that takes place is much different in a paid internship. I work with June Bea at Bea Group for a program that she designed called Work Wonder where we run about 200 high school paid interns at a time. And we developed a program that we call WQ for workplace intelligence, kind of a cousin to EQ. And really talking about those things that have to do with succeeding in the workplace. If you are thinking about offering an unpaid internship, then the employer does not take it as seriously. The student does not take it as seriously. So we put students through a regular interview process, resume process. They have to open a bank account if they wanna get direct deposit. They have employee handbooks that get reviewed. They go through public speaking with a great program called Vocal Awareness with Arthur Joseph. They go through equity uh, training with Tavita Stova, who talks about race and understanding and working with people in the workplace. They learn about how to work with and not participate in social media that has to do with their jobs. And then they go into deep dives, which is six weeks with industry professionals. The reason I mention this is because I believe internships and pre-apprentices are easy to get funding for. If you have questions about that, contact me because I can tell you a lot of resources for that. But I will also say that I'm not a big fan of apprenticeships 
The reason is that at least in the state of California, apprenticeships require so many hours and so many pa so much paperwork. It gets to be discouraging for teachers and faculty, um, and it's discouraging for students. So there are, with the new administration, a lot of opportunities for paid internships and for paid apprentices. Years ago, in my early years, we would have interns, and I was so frustrated with interns that sat all day answering the phone, raking leaves, or filing papers. That doesn't get them excited and encouraged about the possibilities of the workplace. They don't meet people that way. And I'm a firm believer in, obviously, in paid internships and paid pre-apprentices. Great. Uh, another question, Elma? Yes, another one that had a lot of interest was, I have some students who are minority males and who have a prison record. What suggestions do you have for them? Because the pipeline school to prison has been extremely disenfranchising for many. And yet these young men are trying to turn their lives around and um, they're looking forward to some suggestions from the panel. Can I cut in there? Sorry, Greg. I love inmate education. Um, and the reason I think it's fantastic is because we have quite a few organizations nearby where we serve inmate students. I like the idea of entrepreneurship and we have had good luck with entrepreneurship in things like landscaping. Um, a friend of mine is having good luck with a program for incarcerated with woodworking, not woodworking hobbyist, but working with wood for um, building furniture and things like that. We also have the opportunity to put an ed plan together and to work with incarcerated students. Sometimes the challenge is finding faculty who want to teach incarcerated students until they do, at which point they realize these are the best students hands down that they have. And if, again, because we're short on time, if you have questions, please contact me. I have some ideas about that. Just as a side, really fun note, we have an incarcerated program out at Pleasant Valley near Kalinga, where we have retired thoroughbred racehorses and inmates learn how to take and maintain and clean and, you know, whatever the horse word is, like brush or whatever, um, as groomsmen. And, and that's going really well. So th this is a great opportunity for enrollment, for serving the community, and uh, a super fun place to teach. I was a little I love the idea. sorry. <laughs> yeah, but I love the idea that you're putting the initiative and the power back in the hand of the inmate rather than them being at the um, whim of the employer. They're actually creating opportunity where they can start businesses and start yeah. uh, working with others. It's a really cool idea. It really flips that story around. Uh, most of, most got, of the it, sorry, most of the inmate students we work with did something really, really stupid between 16 and 19. Right. Uh, and I believe that we've all done something stupid between 16 and 19. <laughs> um, some of us just don't get caught. Uh, Elma, you want to talk about uh, any other questions? And then we'll, this will be the last question, probably. Yeah, uh, certainly. This um, question says, I'm interested to hear what your institutions are doing with the new barrier of cost. How are students able to earn these degrees without getting into student debt? As we know, many students from low income communities receive Pell and other state grants. But what about when those run out? So as it relates to the work I described earlier, Broward Up, UP, recognizing the unlimited potential of every member of our community. And we've placed 19 locations in the six most challenged zip codes, i.e. those with the highest unemployment rates and lowest post-secondary attainment rates. We've had 2,700 students and none of those students have paid a single dime for the programs that they've gone through. What we've been able to do is leverage external partnerships. One, as I spoke to earlier, all the locations are free to the college. There's no charge to us. And we've been able to leverage, whether it be third party resources in the form of donorship or municipal funding or state funding, so that for every dollar the college has contributed, we've received about $12 in third party funding. So we have had no cost to the 2,700 students who have gone through these programs. It is incredibly important to understand that the minute you add cost, you're already tapping into a myth that it is not for me, for many of these folks, just like I used to think about those things. And so what we've been able to do at no cost, be able to provide things such as workshops, certification programming, as well as programming that on ramps into associate and baccalaureate degrees. I think that's a critical component 
and any programming opportunities that offer a free opportunity, at least free to the individual, particularly those that we're describing that face certain inequities, I think is a good program for us to reinforce. That sounds great. Thank I know you. At, West, at West Hills, we've been working on OER. And I know a lot of people have been working on open education resources. We now have full degrees without having to buy a book. And we are just received a national award for $2 million in addition to achieving the dream um, kind of congrats for, for this work. I am 100% in what Greg is saying, but I wanted to add just one little thing. And that is keep in mind your students who don't qualify, but are still working in service jobs. And that's one place where OER helps. We have California Promise. We have a lot of financial opportunities for students on the, the low socioeconomic groups, but those in the middle who are working, have a couple kids, have a good job, books are still crazy expensive. And so we've been able to uh, really save millions of dollars through open education resources. Yeah, thank you. You guys have been so great. You've given us a critical and pragmatic look at some of the barriers and the issues out there. You've been inspirational and aspirational. Um, I'm not going to forget spectrums of challenge. I'm not going to forget going from digital poverty to digital affluence. I'm not going to forget that uh, we need to listen better inside and work to communicate outside and go into the communities and be there for them. Um, and I want to, uh, I really just appreciate your thoughts. You've, you've given us so much. You, I will save the chat. I'll send out the chat to everybody. I'm going to leave the audience with this question. At LinkedIn, we call it the plus one pledge. What can we all do to address the network gap? Internally, in our company, we're measuring unintended consequences. We're looking at every algorithm. We want it to be based on skills and not zip codes. We've made it so that recruiters can't easily go in and uh, look at your zip code of your college, but look at your skill sets and said, we've, that was a change. And you know what that change did for us? We went from only having underserved populations be one out of every 10 applicants to three out of 10 by just changing one algorithm. We think like Greg and Kelly have said, it's through organizational leadership that we can have programs and partnerships. It's across an organization, not one person doing it by themselves. And we can do together, we can make strides. Um, I wanted to introduce something that's coming down the pipe that we think will really help with LinkedIn profiles and help with your students to tell their stories. It's called Cover Story. It's the ability in 30 seconds to make a video about who you are, where, what you're doing, and where you want to be in your professional life. And it shows up in your background on your profile. It's about to launch by the end of this month. Um, we also have lots of courses and lots of topics around equity, around um, leadership, about creating leaders across uh, the organization, and we hope you take a look at that. You know our motto, it's always be learning. But I do want to thank you, Greg, and I want to thank you, Kelly, for doing this, even though it took us 18 months to get here to this today. Thanks again for joining us today. We hope to see you all next time at the Higher Education Leaders event in May, on May 13th at 10 a.m. Pacific Time, 1 p.m. Eastern Time, titled Agents of Change. Rochelle Clemens, who's been a CIO at four or five different universities and colleges, is going to explore the superhero role of CIOs in the not the new normal, but the next normal. This year, institutions realized the importance and value of technology in their environments. And when the whole world came to a halt in mid-March, CIOs and their teams were there to save the day and lead the way as institutions and in this transition to remote work and instruction in a matter of weeks. They continue to lead into fall and spring, but given the stress and chaos of this year, it may be tempting to want to retreat and return to normal. Ray Clemens declares, do do the opposite instead. Stand your ground, charge that hill, and be the agent of permanent change. I hope you join us. It should be a lively discussion. Uh, not unlike today, Rochelle has a lot to say about this, both pragmatically, critically, and in terms of what we can do better in the future. And for all our future and past events, be sure and go to highereducationleaders.splashthat.com. And that's a wrap, guys. Thank you so much. Let's give a big hand to our panelists.